Hi everybody, welcome to our C Corp training for version eight. We're going to break this into two sessions. This is session one. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Chris Matchison to lead the training. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you, Holly. I want to thank all of you for taking the time to review this before our live Q&A session that will happen in December. So I'm going to be working through uh, the PowerPoint presentation and we're going to go ahead and just get started. So the, the resources that you'll be able to utilize for the abstracts, uh, I mean, we're going to talk about the history and physical, the discharge summary, obviously the CATH report, ECHO, the operative reports, uh, and then pre-op consult notes uh, if they're available. Uh, so it, it's just kind of a fact-finding mission. Um, and these are the different uh, areas you'll be able to query to find your, uh, your data elements. Stuff that we're not going to cover uh, in this training, uh, I think these are all fairly straightforward. The only thing that ever gets, uh, you know, a little bit interesting is the notion of sex. So what we've decided historically is that sex is uh, identified as gender at birth. Uh, so any patients who have undergone gender reassignment surgery or those kind of things, uh, we're gonna stick with gender at birth. Uh, but otherwise we're talking about date of birth, age, uh, race, uh, weight, and height. So before I jump into the kind of the meat and potatoes of this, I just wanna kind of give a 35,000 foot overview. The goal of this is really to code consistently. Uh, the idea here is that no two patients or clinical scenarios are alike. Uh, you can very easily have sicker patients at one hospital just representing different demographics you know, than you have at other hospitals. Uh, I think another important point to make uh, that will, I will kind of be reiterated as we move through uh, is that ad hoc intra-op issues uh, should not be incorporated. So that really shouldn't de change the surgical designation. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that specifically means. Um, but if the surgeon decides intraprocedurally to add something to the surgery that changes the complexity, that doesn't change the designation of the surgery. And what we're really trying to do here is it's really the ability or the inability of either the surgeon or the cardiac surgery program to preemptively identify risk. Uh, in a, and I feel like that's almost an indirect quality metric. So what we're talking about is the type of surgery to start off with here. We're either talking about isolated cabbage cabbage valve or other non-isolated cabbage, which will be kind of everything else or all the exclusions that we'll go over in the next few slides. Uh, cabbage valve can be either cabbage mitral valve repair or replacement or cabbage aortic valve replacement or a combination of the two. So begins our list of the exclusion criteria from isolated cabbage. So this is an extensive list, but it's not exhaustive. Uh, and certainly there's no reason to try to commit all of these to memory. Um, as we move through, again, valve repair or replacement is going to be an automatic exclusion from isolated cabbage. Apologize for that. Any operations that involve adjacent structures, such as heart valves, are going to be an automatic uh, exclusion from the isolated cabbage. Now this next bulleted point is what we were talking about with respect to ad hoc procedures. The idea of like a ventriculectomy or a pericardiectomy, uh, if these were identified as preoperative planned procedures, those would constitute exclusions from isolated cabbage. However, if for example, a surgeon opens the chest, does the sternotomy, and then finds out the pericardium has a tremendous amount of calcium, and at that point decides to do, it decides that a pericardiectomy is required, then that designation, that surgery would remain an isolated cabbage. There are smaller kind of ad hoc procedures that might be introduced, such as patch applications for bleeding, for oozing, those kind of things. That is not an exclusion criteria. A repair of atrial or ventricular septa are considered to be exclusions. So atrial septal defects, ventral, ventricular septal defects are exclusions. Uh, a simple closure of a patent foramen ovale is not an exclusion. Uh, excisions of aneurysms of the heart, again, considered an exclusion if it was diagnosed beforehand and designated in the preoperative planning. Uh, 
anything of the head and neck, intracranial and arterectomies uh, were definitely going to be exclusion criteria. Uh, anything else is going down the, the list here, other open heart surgeries, uh, carotid end arterectomies, aortic end arterectomies, uh, essentially anything that touches the aorta is going to be an exclusion from cabbage. Certainly heart transplant. Some of these are, you know, just kind of uh, self-explanatory. Uh, any aortic aneurysm repair. Uh, again, there's no reason to commit any of these to memory. This will always be a reference for you. This is just examples of things that we often encounter and, you know, lead to an exclusion for that surgery. More examples, uh, I don't have to necessarily read through all of these, uh, but anything that touches the uh, aorta is gonna be an exclusion. You know, the other examples of things that I think are a little less common uh, to have happen in conjunction would be things like mastectomies, amputations, those types of things. Uh, planned ventricular assist uh, implantation is an exclusion if a patient requires VAD uh, at the end of the procedure, that would not be considered uh, an exclusion for that cabbage. So if there's an intraoperative, uh, you know, catastrophe, unfortunately, and patient requires ventricular assist, uh, then if that was not a planned part of the procedure, then that would not be considered an exclusion uh, and that cabbage would need to be reported out. So moving on to the Next category, uh, which is the cabbage plus valve. Uh, as I mentioned before, this can be cabbage and mitral valve, either repair or replacement, cabbage and aortic valve replacement. So it does not include aortic valve repair um, and or a combination of the two. So cabbage, aortic valve, and mitral valve, either repair or replacement. Uh, the one caveat there, uh, which is the, is the Bentall procedure, uh, a bentol procedure is used for repair of an ascending aortic aneurysm, uh, and that would be considered an exclusion. Uh, essentially, anything that excludes uh, cabbage uh, is going to also exclude a cabbage plus valve, unless we're talking about the valve surgery in and of itself. Um, so uh, exclusion for cabbage valve, again, for the aortic valve repair uh, my understanding and what we've discussed previously is the reason the aortic valve repair is an exclusion from cabbage valve is that aortic valve repairs are, they tend to be fairly uh, minimally invasive, it tends to be maybe a ligation of a papillary fibroelastoma or something small. Uh, so in which case that would be uh, considered a cabbage uh, alone. Um, but as we move through any surgeries on the pulmonic valve, the tricuspid valve, Again, getting into the ventriculectomy, pericardiectomy, those kind of things, excisions of aneurysms of the heart. Uh, again, as long as it is a pre-planned uh, procedure, pre-planned -pre operation, uh, then that would be an exclusion as well. And arterectomies, uh, you know, either of the aorta or a carotid end arterectomy for carotid artery stenosis is going to be considered uh, an exclusion criteria from this cabbage valve. Thora uh, thoracic end arterectomies, uh, heart transplant, obviously, uh, any sort of uh, concomitant uh, bypass surgery, vascular surgeries are all going to be exclusion criteria. Uh, we'll talk about the idea of coronary artery fistula um, as, as an exclusion or as one of the caveats as we move through. Uh, coronary artery fistulas or open heart surgeries for technically for bypass for anomalous coronary anatomy those are going to be exclusions uh, from the cabbage designation. Uh, and the reason here is those represent a, a very distinct patient population that's really not representative of the standard cardiovascular disease patient population who's going for uh, coronary bypass graft surgery. So those technically do not constitute cabbage and those would be uh, considered exclusion criteria. So that's either coronary artery fistula or anomalous coronary anatomy. Resection of lobes or segments of the lung. This is important to note. Uh, if it's a, like a wedge resection, something more substantial, and again, as long as it was planned preoperatively, then that would be considered an exclusion criteria. Uh, if we're talking about simple lung biopsies, uh, these are very small uh, procedures that don't really add to the risk uh, and would not be considered exclusion criteria. Uh, 
Uh, again, there's the mastectomy, amputations, those kind of things, which I think would be highly unlikely to be performed simultaneously. Uh, and then as we get to the bottom, this comes up uh, often, or at least frequently, uh, the idea of a full open maze uh, or a type 4 maze. Uh, this would be considered an exclusion for aortic valve surgeries. It is not an exclusion for mitral valve surgeries. The rationale here is that in order to do the mitral valve, uh, an aortotomy is performed already, so the left atrium is entered. Uh, that is the added risk of a maze procedure for an aortic valve uh, surgery, for example. But because the surgeon has already entered the left atrium to perform the mitral valve repair or replacement, uh, the fact that the maze is going to be performed at the same time doesn't really add to the risks of the procedure. So again, just to reiterate, Maze, a full open maze procedure uh, is not considered an exclusion if it's a mitral valve surgery. If it's an aortic valve surgery, it would be considered an exclusion. These are a couple of, I believe these are new data elements from last year. Uh, hopefully they're kind of self-explanatory and not controversial. Uh, just looking for primary payer, you know, going down the list there. Uh, they, those could be read, but you know, Medicare, Medicaid, exactly, or, or uh, for example, uh, and then second, secondary or supplemental payer, um, just those would be what you'd be looking for. Uh, so those are just examples of the various designations and how they would be coded and captured. Hospital discharge date. Uh, again, hopefully this isn't uh, anything that becomes too contentious. Um, discharge date uh, is, you know, discharged home or discharged to another hospital or another facility. The discharge date can, I guess, technically discharge can be to a different um, service or not a, to a different area within the same facility. So a patient could stay within the same hospital but get discharged to a skilled nursing unit, and that would be the discharge date. Um, the discharge date for patients who die uh, would be the date of death. Uh, that would be in the cases of uh, brain death. It would be the date of death would be the date of brain death. And obviously, in the case of brain death, sometimes those patients are going to go for organ donation uh, and they be, can be maintained on life support uh, for extended periods of time before organ harvesting happens. Um, but the date of death, so therefore the date of discharge would be the date of brain death uh, for those particular cases. Um, and then again, uh, patients who get discharged uh, but stay even in the same bed, if they get discharged to hospice, for example, if there is a discharge designation, that is the date that you're looking for. Sometimes patients will be transferred to different units or different uh, services. That does not con constitute a discharge date. Status at hospital discharge, uh, so patients either alive at discharge uh, and then last known status was alive, discharged alive, died after discharge, discharged to hospice or died in the hospital. So hopefully that's going to be fairly self-explanatory as well. Was the patient transferred to another acute care facility, another hospital, binary? It's going to be either yes or no. And then you will want to uh, look for that specific date uh, that that transfer occurred. Mortality date. Uh, again, uh, the big thing here, mortality date tends to correspond with the date of discharge and the date of discharge for patients uh, who, uh, who are considered uh, or designated as brain dead. That will be your date of discharge uh, if it's applicable. And again, patients can be continued on life support for extended periods of time uh, prior to organ harvesting, um, but the date of discharge and therefore the mortal mortality date is the date of brain death, the date the brain death is uh, determined. Uh, status at 30 days uh, post-surgery, uh, either discharge or in the hospital, doesn't matter. They're just looking at this 30-day cutoff. Uh, either alive, dead, or unknown. And uh, again, the most important thing is just that 30-day cutoff, regardless of where the patient is at that point in time. 
surgeon's name, just looking for first, last, and middle name, and then the surgeon's uh, California medical license number. Ideally, this would be provided by the hospital. All right, moving on to diabetes. Always some good questions come with this. Uh, so what we've been using historically is a hemoglobin A1C greater than 6.5. I can tell you at our facility, that's what we use to make the diagnosis of diabetes. Um, does a patient have this as a designation or a diagnosis? Yes, no, or unknown. In the rare instance that we're talking about, a patient with a pancreatic transplant, uh, technically they no longer have diabetes. They produce endogenous insulin with the transplant. Uh, but they would be coded as yes uh, for history of diabetes. And this bottom line here, if a patient had a pancreatic transplant code other, that actually belongs on this slide um, when we're talking about diabetes control. So obviously a multitude of ways that patients can control diabetes as we move down from one to seven. I'd like to just give some examples. Uh, patients who have none as a diabetes control strategy, really those are only going to be patients with a new diagnosis of diabetes. Patients have no previous diagnosis, but they also don't see uh, doctors on a regular basis. They come in, their hemoglobin A1C is nine. Okay, so diabetes, yes, any sort of control, none whatsoever. The next is diet control, so not on any medications, um, over the counter or um, you know, non-prescription uh, would would also be considered diet only. Things like cinnamon, for example. And number three is oral hyperglycemics, uh, and those would be kind of your prototypical historical ones like metformin or glipizide. Uh, four is going to be insulin. Five is where that pancreatic transplant would be, uh, be classified. So it goes under the, the heading of other for pancreatic transplant. Another, number six, other subcutaneous medications. Those are things like your GLP-1 agonists. So these actually uptake trait or increase insulin secretion. Uh, and these are going to be like Victoza, Bieta, and Trulicity. You might see those in the chart. Those would go under, um, under those other subcutaneous medications. And then finally, unknown. Uh, the only patients that would be designated as unknown would be patients who present and they have altered levels of consciousness or are dead on arrival. So we just don't know what the treatment strategy for their, their diabetes would be. Uh, and this is just a, a reference for additional information uh, if it's desired. Uh, dialysis, indicate if the patient is uh, currently undergoing dialysis on a routine basis, yes, no, or unknown. Uh, some of the questions we've had previously are patients aren't routinely on dialysis, but they're initiated on dialysis prior to their surgery. Uh, that would be a yes designation. Uh, there's a whole multitude of forms of dialysis, peritoneal dialysis. You can see there CVVHD, CRRT. All of those would be a yes designation. Uh, it's important to note ultrafiltration is a no. Ultrafiltration is really for volume management only, uh, usually for heart failure patients, for example. So that you would code no, um, but for any other uh, dialysis uh, therapy or therapeutic strategy, you would code yes. Hypertension, it's important that this is uh, actually uh, diagnosed and captured within the chart. So this must be a distinction or a diagnosis within the chart in order to code yes. You want to indicate if the patient has a current diagnosis of hypertension. Hypertension can be managed with medications, diet, or exercise. So the, the home medications aren't necessarily going to trigger this. Uh, it really comes down to, was it documented as a pre-existing condition, essentially, uh, by either a physician or a physician extended practitioner? Of note, there are some things that might 
you know, come up like questions of Lasix. Lasix is not a blood pressure medication. It's a pure diuretic. Uh, other medications like aldactone. Uh, I've had patients on aldactone, which technically does operate as a partial blood pressure agent, um, but they're on it for different reasons. So you really don't want to go just based on the medical uh, therapy alone. It really needs to be a, a designation that's made in the chart. Uh, endocarditis, uh, again, another thing that should be documented in the chart, uh, either yes or no. Uh, this is one of those rare instances where findings intraoperatively kind of change uh, how the patient is risk stratified. Um, so this could be either a pre-existing diagnosis of endocarditis or it can be for patients who have a diagnosis of endocarditis, uh, which is made intraoperatively. There are a, a couple of other diagnoses to be aware of, uh, Marantic endocarditis uh, or Liebman-Sachs endocarditis. Uh, this is a non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis. So it's just fibrin and platelets. Uh, that kinda, it's like a meshwork that adheres to the leaflets. Uh, it is a non-infectious endocarditis, so it should be coded as a no. Really, we're just looking for bacterial endocarditis. And then type, uh, is it active? So if endocarditis uh, is captured there, it's a yes for that data element, then you have to decide is this is an active or is it a treated endocarditis? So what you're looking for for treated is patient is no, no longer on antibiotics. Uh, if they are on antibiotics, uh, then this would be considered an active infectious endocarditis type. Uh, and then also if it is a diagnosis that's made intraoperatively, that would also be considered active. So bottom line, treated as no antibiotic medication at the time of surgery. Moving on to chronic lung disease. Uh, this one is nuanced. It can be complex, uh, and it always uh, raises a little bit of you know, consternation uh, for the auditors and for myself. Uh, it, it's a little bit of a moving target. So I wanted to break it out. We'll go through these slides, but I just wanted to talk a little bit up front about, uh, I think, a framework that might help here uh, for chronic lung disease. The, the first part of it is, is there a documentation of the diagnosis of chronic pulmonary disability within the chart? Um, you know, that really needs to be there, part one. And then the second part is what this slide indicates, uh, which is a distinction of severity. And severity can be determined a couple of different ways. It can be determined with pulmonary function tests, you know, so that's your FEV1, uh, for example, there, and it's broken out. Uh, FEV1, 60 to 75% would be mild, 50 to 59% would be moderate, and an FEV1 less than 50% would constitute severe chronic lung disease. It can also be determined with an ABG, so a PaO2 of less than 60 or a PCO2 greater than 50. Uh, or it can be determined by chronic medical therapy, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit of detail. Uh, there are some caveats when we're talking about pulmonary function studies that we often uh, discuss. Um, obviously, pulmonary function studies uh, the, the quality and the validity of a pulmonary function study uh, is really contingent upon a patient's ability to cooperate. So some of the confounders would be the fact that patients are often relegated to bed rest after an angiogram, but I often order pulmonary function studies after I do angiograms. Patients could be an active decompensated heart failure, which could certainly skew the results. Uh, patients could still have significant sedation on board from the previous procedure, um, or they can have, you know, hemodynamic support devices like intra-aortic balloon pumps or impellas in place uh, in which, you know, it would be very, very difficult for them to give a true uh, inspiratory and expiratory effort. So there are some caveats to take into consideration there. Chronic lung disease is not based solely on the fact that a person is currently smoking or if they're on home oxygen. Uh, 
Now, if a patient, and we'll talk about this in the next couple of slides, if a patient has a prior diagnosis of chronic lung disease and they're on home oxygen, then that's an automatic for a designation of severe chronic lung disease, regardless of whether or not there are PFTs or an ABG. However, if a patient's on home oxygen and there is no prior diagnosis, then those patients are gonna be designated as unknown. So it's not specifically uh, whether or not a patient is on home oxygen, that, that doesn't help you make the diagnosis per se. Chest X-ray findings alone do not necessarily constitute chronic lung disease. Uh, and then there on that fourth bulleted point are a bunch of other uh, diagnoses uh, that would constitute chronic lung disease, mesothelioma, for example, or asbestosis, radiation pneumonitis. Um, all of those would qualify as chronic lung disease. Atelectasis, which is kind of a compression of, of the alveoli, which are the functional units of the lung, atelectasis uh, in and of itself uh, is a transient condition and would not be considered chronic lung disease. Uh, and then just a few more points on this. Um, chronic lung disease, uh, obviously patients with COPD or chronic bronchitis or emphysema. Um, patients with asthma or seasonal allergies are not considered to have chronic lung disease. I think that's important to note. Uh, and then finally, uh, DLCOs, or which is diffusion capacity of the lung, uh, that those values are not used to determine whether or not patient has chronic lung disease. So kind of a nice summary side for this, for C-Corp purposes. Patient really needs document documentation of chronic lung disease within the chart. Uh, if they have that designation and they're on home oxygen, then they're considered severe, regardless of whether or not PFTs or an ABG is available. Um, the documentation needs to be there, and then you use this ancillary data, uh, you know, objectively, the, the PFTs or an ABG value to determine uh, if they're mild, moderate, or severe. Pneumonia, do patients have a history of it or do they not? Um, so no recent or remote uh, in the, the time frame is 30 days. So beyond 30 days, it would be considered a remote uh, pneumonia event. If it's within the last 30 days, uh, it's gonna be uh, recent. Okay, the next data element is liver disease. In these these big ones like liver disease, for example, I think it's important to really get at the why. Why is it important that we capture this? So patients with liver disease are coagulopathic. They bleed. They're going to have far more complications intraoperatively. So it's really, really important to identify these. Uh, in you know, as we move on, we'll talk about immunocompromised patients and why that's important also. But it's kind of it's nice to take a step back and understand the big picture of why is it important that we are, are, are very diligent about capturing uh, these particular um, risk components. Uh, liver disease, really with patients uh, with history of hepatitis B, hepatitis C, cirrhosis, or any of the sequelae of cirrhosis, things like portal hypertension or esophageal varices, um, spontaneous bacterial pneumonitis or SBP, uh, or history of cirrhosis, or I'm sorry, history of ascites or encephalopathy. All of those would be an indication of chronic lung disease for which you would code yes. Um, chronic alcohol abuse, uh, I think that's a little bit debatable. I don't think that's an automatic yes. Uh, if somebody has a history of chronic alcohol abuse, then you start to look for those sequelae of cirrhosis. Um, uh, if they have those, then you would code yes. But alcohol abuse, uh, regardless of volume of consumption, in and of itself doesn't constitute liver disease. So we're really, like I said, trying to capture the patients with a compromise in synthetic function because they bleed. Uh, that's, that's really what you're looking at here. Uh, we would say chronic liver disease, we would code no for patients with a history of hepatitis C if they were treated with Harvoni. Uh, which is an antiretroviral, obviously, and they have no viral load and no sequelae of liver disease. 
So if they have none of those aforementioned cirrhosis, societies, peritonitis, encephalopathy, they have no viral load, then they would be a no for liver disease. Uh, that's one of the caveats of this, this particular data element. Uh, and then finally, don't code liver disease for patients with a history of liver transplant if they have no residual uh, anatomic or uh, systemic issues. Immunocompromised patients, again, getting at the why, why is it important that we identify these immunocompromised patients? Well, because they have problems with wound healing uh, and they're prone to infection. So obviously, they're going to be much more complex post-operative patients. So it's important to identify these. Uh, immunocompromised patients uh, can either be uh, issues with infection, so HIV AIDS, which we'll talk about, or patients who have been on immunosuppressive therapy. Uh, immunosuppressive therapy can include systemic steroids, uh, anti-rejection medications for patients with history of solid organ transplant, or chemotherapy, chemotherapeutic agents. It doesn't include topical steroids, one-time systemic, kind of that quote-unquote stress dose steroid, uh, inhaled steroids, uh, anything that is a preoperative protocol, um, or if they're given for a history of contrast allergy, for example, before an angiogram, uh, we usually give a bolus dose of uh, steroid, either solumedrol or, or um, yeah, usually solumedrol. But those one-time doses would not constitute a, an immunocompromised status. So it'll be either yes or no. The unknown is if patients have, for example, been on chemotherapeutic agents, but the timing is unknown. So if we don't know if it's been within that 30-day time frame, you would code it as an unknown. Okay, so again, we're talking about either diseases or drugs that lead to an immunocompromised patient some of these examples. Um, here it states HIV. I think historically we've say, said um, it, the AIDS designation is actually the immunocompromised patient. So the diagnosis for AIDS is going to be a CD4 count less than 200 or the presence of an opportunistic infection. If either one of those is present, then the patient would be considered immunocompromised. Um, but thalassemias, for example, uh, and then there's a whole litany of different medications uh, that lead to immunocompromise, a lot of anti-rheumatic medications, obviously chemotherapeutic agents uh, are going to lead to immunocompromise as well. A few examples of things that do not compromise or do not are not considered immunocompromised, splenic sequestration, uh, partial splenectomy, uh, those things are not considered to be uh, immunocompromising conditions. Uh, and then again, another potential for the coding of unknown is when there's conflicting information or if we don't know whether or not that specific immunosuppressive uh, agent was administered within 30 days of surgery. Uh, an automatic yes really should be organ, a solid organ transplant because those patients are all going to be on uh, immunosuppressive agents. COVID-19. Again, also a new data, data element, obviously, that didn't exist 12 months ago. Um, so here we're looking for this very specific uh, uh, study, the COVID-19 SARS-CoV-2. Uh, positive antibody tests are not captured. So, uh, And then it's going to be either no or yes uh, with a few different uh, potentials, either yes prior to hospitalization, yes in the hospital prior to surgery, yes in the hospital after surgery, or yes, after discharge within 30 days of surgery. Cancer, also new, uh, a new data element here, yes or no. Uh, and really we wanna know if there's a history of uh, cancer within five years of that operation. So a yes is going to be cancer within five years. A no is going to be patients who have either never had cancer or who have had cancer, but not within that five-year time frame. And we're going to really limit it to maybe some of the more significant cancers. So low-grade skin cancers like basal cell or squamous cell uh, carcinoma 
are not going to be uh, uh, captured here. Peripheral arterial disease indicate whether the patient has a history of peripheral arterial disease. Uh, so this can be a few different ways. They can either have symptoms uh, such as claudication. Uh, they can have a history, obviously, of amputation for vascular insufficiency. Or they can have undergone a procedure for their vascular obstruction. So either a bypass surgery or, uh, you know, some sort of peripheral stenting procedures. Uh, this some of the things that do not constitute peripheral arterial disease. Histories of deep vein thrombosis, vein stripping, AV fistulas for dialysis, uh, history of IVC filter placement for DVT or pulmonary embolism uh, are not. Those are going to be coded as no. Some of the non-invasive tests for peripheral arterial disease you may be looking for are things like, you know, imaging, ultrasound, which uh, determines that stenosis is present greater than 50% or ankle brachial index is less than 0 0.9. So there's really three different ways to make this uh, diagnosis. It's either through imaging or tests. The second is through symptoms like claudication. And then the third would be patients who have a history of therapy rendered, such as bypass. Cerebrovascular disease indicate whether the patient has current or previous history of either strokes or TIAs here. The, the difference here uh, being that with the TIA, all the neurologic dysfunction uh, resolves within 24 hours. So there's no residual neurologic deficit beyond 24 hours. That's how we diagnose the TIA and distinguish it from a stroke where you can have neurologic dysfunction that lasts greater than 24 hours. With a stroke, you can also have no residual neurologic deficit, but it may take days, weeks, or years for that to happen. Um, so it's really that 24-hour cutoff that's most important. But as far as designating cerebrovascular disease, we're talking about either strokes or TIAs um, or imaging uh, also. So carotid ultrasound, almost all patients going for open heart surgery these days undergo carotid ultrasound. If there's carotid stenosis greater than 50%, uh, then that would be considered uh, cerebral vascular disease. Uh, any history of vertebral artery or intracranial uh, stenosis from any type of imaging modality, whether you're talking about CT scans or MRIs, uh, would also warrant a, a yes designation for this data element. And then obviously, if they've undergone previous revascularization uh, surgeries, either cervical or cerebral artery or um, carotids, for example, uh, a point of note for this particular element, subdural hematomas are considered no for cerebrovascular disease. Subdural hematomas are usually secondary to trauma, uh, and that's a, as opposed to subarachnoid hemorrhages. Uh, we've said subarachnoid hemorrhage would be designated as a yes for this data element uh, because most of those are secondary to rupture of intracranial aneurysms. So subdural hematomas, no subarachnoid hemorrhages are yes. Uh, and then also, uh, for, the, for our purposes, subclavian disease is considered uh, cerebrovascular disease. It's not considered peripheral arterial disease. So if you see subclavian stenosis greater than 50%, it would go under the cerebrovascular disease designation. Prior CVA uh, indicate whether the patient has a history of stroke. Again, we're looking for that focal neurologic, it's really a focal neurologic deficit. Uh, it's a little less common to see global uh, dysfunction. We're really looking for something focal. Uh, and it can be a as a result of either a blockage or a bleed. So you can have a hemorrhagic stroke or you can have an ischemic stroke. Uh, and then those ischemic strokes are usually gonna be cardioembolic in nature. Um, and it's like I said before, a CVA or a stroke uh, is going to be neurologic dysfunction that lasts greater than 24 hours. Um, so this is going to be yes, no, or unknown, as that's as, a, as opposed to uh, the TIA, which is uh, less than 24 hours with full recovery and no residual neurologic deficit. 
And then timing of the CVA, again, there's a 30 day cut point here for recent versus remote. If it happened greater than 30 days ago, it's gonna be a remote event. If it happened within 30 days of the surgery, it's gonna be considered recent. And then here's your transient ischemic attack. Again, like we've mentioned a few times now, no focal neurologic deficit beyond 24 hours. So complete resolution of symptoms within 24 hours is a transient ischemic attack. Uh, and that's just gonna be a yes or no. Now for the cerebrovascular disease, uh, specifically carotid stenosis, you want to be able to say which carotid artery is affected. Is it the right? Is it the left? Or is it both? Uh, and this would be a greater than 50% stenosis, uh, usually with carotid ultrasound, as I mentioned. Um, so you want to code what's found on the study uh, before entering the operating room. Is the 50% stenosis present? Yes or no? Uh, it really, this is not asking about prior revascularization. So this is just asking if at that moment in time, is there active stenosis of greater than 50%? So a history of carotid stenosis, for example, would be yes under the data element of cerebrovascular disease. But if there's no stenosis within that stent, if there's no instant restenosis, then they would not get a yes here. And then you just want to further kind of, um, you know, semi-quantitatively uh, assess this. This should be available, this data should be available either from, you know, cerebral angiograms or the carotid uh, ultrasound. Uh, you just want percentage stenosis like we do uh, with the uh, coronaries. And then there's examples of what you do for these semi-quantitative terms like total occlusion uh, would be 100% occluded, obviously, but things like critical, severe, or subtotal are uh, considered in that 80 to 99% range. And then moderate stenosis was, would be from 50 to 79%. And same thing, obviously, for the left carotid. All right, so cerebrovascular disease prior carotid surgery, this is where you would capture that previous either carotid endarterectomy or history of carotid stenting procedure. Uh, and it's either gonna be yes or no. So the carotid endarterectomy is a vascular surgery. Uh, it's an open procedure where the vessel is actually exposed um, and then essentially filleted open and the plaque that lines the inside of the blood vessel is scraped out. Uh, stenting is obviously a less invasive, what we consider a percutaneous procedure where a stent is placed very much like we do in the coronaries, uh, all in the, the hopes or the goal of increasing cerebral blood flow. Moving on to the labs, uh, as far as all of these labs are concerned, uh, we really want them within six weeks. And the other important part is prior to anesthesia, anesthesia management. Uh, anesthesiologists walk in the room, and the first thing they do is they bolus patients. So there can be a lot of hemodilution with, with most of these labs. So again, those are the two points. We want the lab values to be within six weeks and prior to the anesthesiologist going to work. Uh, and then there's just some normal ranges here. So that's for creatinine, uh, total albumin, Again, same thing, capture results uh, six weeks within six weeks of surgery. And total, total bilirubin uh, really was going to be the same thing, again, prior to anesthesiologists going to work. And finally, the INR. And with all these values, you also want to avoid point of care tests. So these should all be true lab results, um, uh, ideally not point of care tests performed in the operating room and sodium. Previous coronary artery bypass graft surgery um, should be pretty straightforward. Has the patient undergone 
a cabbage before. Uh, and this could be, you know, mid cab lemus, which are, you know, minimally invasive, um, off pump procedures, but has the patient undergone a bypass surgery before. These do not include anything done in the cath lab. So stents, angioplasties, those kind of things do not get captured here. This is just previous bypass surgery. Uh, and then also previous valve. This is a little bit different though. You also do capture those less invasive percutaneous procedures like transcatheter aortic valves, your TAVRs, mitral clips, uh, even balloon valvuloplasties, balloon aortic or balloon mitral valvuloplasties. Uh, would be captured here, uh, in addition to your your traditional open heart uh, aortic or mitral valve procedures. Previous PCIs, uh, so anything performed in the cath lab uh, in the pursuit of re percutaneous revascularization, essentially. So. Um, has anybody tried to either use a balloon uh, to open up a blood vessel, placed a stent, uh, atherectomy, which is essentially just a high-speed drill uh, that drills out the calcium within the blood vessel, brachytherapy, which utilizes radiation. Uh, or thrombectomy, uh, which is uh, extraction of clot within the blood vessel. Uh, and these would also... Uh, be uh, so these are successful or unsuccessful PCIs as well. So even if the attempt was unsuccessful, it would get a yes designation. And then timing of the procedure here. So is it within six hours? So six hours or less, uh, or greater than six hours? So greater than six hours is kind of history of PCI. If you're talking less than or equal to six hours. Usually, those are that the attempt here is to capture cath lab misadventures. So, some sort of cath lab catastrophe, whether it's a coronary perforation or a dissection uh, where the blood vessel just completely closes down and the interventional cardiologists need to call in the cardiothoracic surgeon. That's usually where you're going to see a PCI happening within six hours of the open heart surgery. Uh, and the timing here is the timing from the removal of the catheter in the cath lab to skin incisions. So there's various start times when we talk about an open heart surgery. Uh, is it the time the patient em enters the operating room? Is it time the anesthesiologist induces the patient with anesthesia? Um, or in this case, we're talking about actual skin incision time. Prior myocardial infarction indicate if the patient has had at least one documented previous myocardial infarction at any time prior to surgery. Um, so myocardial infarction really needs to be a clinical uh, diagnosis. Myocardial infarction should not be diagnosed based on an EKG alone. Uh, I get more than my share of consults in the clinic uh, for abnormal EKGs that show old heart attack pattern and patient's heart is completely normal. So you really can't just look at the EKG alone and make that determination. And then the timing of the heart attack. So this has also raised several interesting questions in the past. Um, you know, a heart attack is a clinical event with biological evidence of myocardial injury. Uh, in that biological evidence, at this point in time, usually is a troponin, so troponin elevation. And troponin's, you know, just a, a component of myocardium. When the myocardial cells, those myocytes, are damaged, the troponin leaks out into circulation, and then we can measure that, and we use that to determine, one, if myocardium has been jeopardized, and we can also use that to determine loosely how much myocardium has been damaged. So the time frames here are going to be less than an e or equal to six hours, six hours to 24 hours, uh, and then to days, you know, either one to seven days. So essentially one week, eight days to 21 days or greater than 21 days out. Uh, the question often arises, how do we determine the timing of the myocardial infarction? Uh, is that the time the patient presents to the emergency room? Is that the time the patient starts to have chest pain? Is that the time the patient's troponin comes back as positive? And what we've decided in the past is that we start the clock ticking 
when the patient with the patient's first onset of symptoms. So patient has chest discomfort at home for three hours and then they present to the emergency room and they send off a troponin and it comes back positive. Well, we say that myocardial infarction started three hours before they presented. Uh, and the idea here is that the myocardium, those myocytes are already being damaged uh, as soon as the chest pain starts. So we think it's a little bit more accurate and representative of the myocardial damage process uh, as a whole. Heart failure, uh, this is another one with, uh, you know, several different, uh, you know, caveats and some nuance here. Uh, it starts off pretty straightforward, indicate whether there is a physician documentation or report that the patient has been in a state of heart failure, yes or no? Is there a diagnosis of heart failure? And then we go a little bit further to say, does this constitute an acute heart failure condition? Is it a chronic heart failure condition? And the, the time cut point there is two weeks. If it's heart failure, either new or worsening, within two weeks of the surgery, then that's considered to be an acute decompensation. If they have a history of heart failure uh, with uh, exacerbation greater than two weeks prior to the procedure, that's considered to be a chronic state. Or you can have both. You can have acute on chronic. So that's a patient who has a history of heart failure who, ha who now has an acute decompensation within the last two weeks prior to the surgery. And then as far as classifications are concerned, um, you know, we, we break this out into class one, class two, class three, and class four. Uh, this is kind of informational only um, in order to stipulate what class of heart failure decompensation a patient has. It needs to be documented in the chart. So this is not something that we would expect anybody to be kind of deciphering uh, based on symptomatology. Um, but in general, we consider class one to be patients without any symptoms of heart failure. Class two would be patients with some symptoms of heart failure with moderate activity. Usually we use, you know, housework uh, as an example of, of level of threshold. Uh, if they're up walking around, vacuuming, cleaning, doing those kind of things, do they get short of breath? Yes, then they would cons be considered to have class two heart failure symptoms. Class three would be a lot of symptoms. So with minimal activity, they get up, they walk to the refrigerator, they get short of breath, or they go take a shower or try to get dressed. Uh, and they're short of breath, that would be a, a class three heart failure um, designation. And then class four is essentially short of breath all the time. I mean, they're dysmic doing essentially nothing, just sitting there on the couch, they're short of breath. 